So last time we had done a few small things, but we'll quickly run through them. <laughs> what we did last time. Narad has finished answering the puzzle which Savitri's mother was facing about this riddle of this world. Why in God's world there is suffering, there is pain, there is grief, there is sorrow. Why there is death? And she even questions whether it was Naras God who had created this miserable suffering world. She was kind of blunt also in that respect. And then Narada sets himself out to answer in detail every aspect of what she was asking, the questions which she had raised, every aspect of it. And as I said, we can kind of divide his long answer. He must have been talking almost for two hours in reply to what Savitri's mother had said. She first point which he was making is that pain is a hammer of God. Pain is a hammer of God by which God shapes man, sculpts man with that hammer. And then he extends this argument by saying that even when God comes down here as an avatar, he takes upon himself the entire burden of this creation. He accepts pain, he accepts misery, he accepts death, he accepts suffering. Without that, the world cannot be saved unless he participates in it. And the example which he gives is the example of the crucifixion of Christ. How he carried the cross on his shoulders and suffered to redeem the fate of man. Then he says that the task of the world redeemer, world redeemer is to some extent different than the author. World redeemer comes here in the context of the difficulties of this creation. Avatar comes here to extend the scope of evolutionary growth from one stage to the other. So when he comes here as a world redeemer, he comes in the context of the difficulties of this creation. Then he cautions very forcefully that, well, this is the condition and man should not take the path of the titan. He should not force the issue in his creation here. He should prepare himself gradually and allow things to happen. Don't take the titan's path, that is what he says to you. And then finally, he answers to the queen by saying that, after all, it was her choice to have come to this world. Don't complain. You had made the choice. At one time, at one point, you were very happy up there in the transcendent, blissful and all that. But you became curious of this creation. And then you have plunged into this. It was your choice. It was your free will by which you have accepted this. And then, of course, the justification is given that you have done it for a purpose. It is by that process it can be taken forward. The soul became curious of the shadow cast by truth in the darkness here. Shadow, it saw the shadow, became curious and then it came here. So don't complain about that. It is a process and you have accepted 
carry on. So, therefore, you have to suffer. You can't help it. It is a mechanism by which things will grow, will expand. The future, the bright future will arrive. It is for that purpose you have come here and you are carrying on your work. So, it is in that context then Ashwapati asks a very pertinent question. If the spirit, if the soul has plunged into this creation here, does it mean that the soul, the spirit is ruled by the outward world? It's a very blunt question he's asking Ashwapati. Of course, he you knows the answer, but he's raising that issue to clarify certain aspects of it, you see. Is then the spirit ruled by an outward world? That is what he is asking first to see. And then, if it is ruled by the outward world, is there a remedy within? Can a solution be found? But he is now focusing the entire point, discussion, towards his daughter's fate because that is the matter of concern for him towards his daughter's fate and he hoped, he thought that it was the Divine Mother herself who had taken the mortal birth here. Is she going to suffer like this? That was the question he is asking now. But what, is, well before that he is defining in this sentence, what is fate if now the spirits will fulfilled by cosmic force. That is the definition according to Ashwapati. That after all, fate is nothing but the spirit's will fulfilled by cosmic force. That is the definition of fate. Spirit has accepted the cosmic working, it is going through the cosmic functionings, cosmic aspects and it is coming here with its own will. So it is that will which is really working through the cosmic force. It is that will which is working through the cosmic force. And therefore he says, I thought that a mighty power had come along with Savitri. Where is that power now? You should come to suffer. I deemed a mighty power had come with her. Is not that power the high compere of fate? Is it not accompanying her, that power, that Shakti? Is she not accompanying Savitri? Now, this is a question in a way. But I will rather read it as a rhetorical question. It is, is not that power the high compere of fate in the context of Savitri? Is not that power the high compere of Yes, it is. That power is the compere of her fate. The answer, the rhetorical question means the answer is yes, dear. The answer is yes, dear, you see. But it is Narad who has to say yes. He has put a rhetorical question and it is Narad who has to say yes. Why he has to say yes? Ashwapati knows it. And he is kind of insisting that Narad says yes. He is insisting upon that. He should say yes. Because when he says yes, in that yes, the entire occult power of his spirit is put. And it is that occult power then which will start working in the life of Savitri. His yes is important. Will it happen? Yes. The moment you say yes, then the whole thing is the same. The example which I had given you was last time when Shevandu, sorry, when the mother met Shevandu for the first time on 29th March. 1914, she saw the supramental world, 
and she asked him, will it come down? And she even said, yes. And immediately she started seeing the Shippam River descending down. Again, here also, the point is, it is not that she sees the supremacy world. She also knows that it will come down. Still, she is asking Shevandu, will it come down? Will it come down? And he says, yes. Because in that yes, is the entire yogic force which is put here. It means that it is that yogic force now which starts operating in the entire cosmic mechanism, in the entire cosmic process. It starts functioning, it starts operating. So she is asking that question in a certain sense deliberately <laughs> and he is also answering in the same manner deliberately that it has to happen. That's the power. He is that power, is that is not that power, the high computer of fate? Yes, it is. And then this is what Ashwapati is asking Narad. And Narad replies now to Ashwapati, one of the most beautiful answers, one of the most powerful passages also in Savitri. But Narad answered covering truth with truth. That is what we have seen last time, covering truth with truth. Now, that's a very beautiful phrase, as I said last time, and it is Essentially, the Vedic phrase, Rute narutam apihitam, Rute narutam apihitam. Truth is covered by truth. He is not disclosing anything, yet he is disclosing also. See. And the example which I had given you last time was, it is the Solomonic explanation, opening of justice of saying indirectly, it will happen like that. So, it had that Salamanic reference also here, both Vedic and Salamanic in the phrase, truth with covering truth with truth. And then he sets himself now to answer Ashwapati in great, great, beautiful details. O oh, Ashwapati, random seeing the ways along whose banks your footsteps stray or run in casual hours and moment to the gods and moment to the gods. Yet your least tumbling are forcing above. Least tumbling are forcing above. In casual hours and moment to the gods. Now here, of course, what Savitri is going to make is not a casual hour. What Savitri is going to face is not going to be a casual hour, obviously. It is going to be the moment of the gods. Savitri is going to see. And if it is going to be the moment of the gods, then its result is already forcing above what is going to happen. He is assuring. Yes, it is going to happen. Already foreseen about what Savitri is going to meet, is going to face, that is already foreseen about because it is happening in the moment of the gods, in the divine moment, in the divine working, in the divine scheme of operation. And therefore, he says that to you it looks to be an accident. To you, it looks to be a calamitous, bad fit, ill fit. But even here in this context, it is something which has already been foreseen above. In fact, foreseen above is important. When Ashwapati received the boon from the Divine Mother, the bone itself already says in it that this tremendous hour shall arrive. 
in the dust tremendous hour a seed shall be sown so this tremendous hour is already seen about force and about we are seeing that earlier let's see again that in this tremendous hour 91.9 a seed shall be sown in this tremendous hour is all you see now about in the divine mother herself has said in other words if her boon has to be fulfilled this tremendous hour must arrive it is a part of the boon the arrival of this tremendous hour is already foreseen a branch of heaven transplant to human soil nature shall only her mortal step Fate shall be changed by an unchanging will. Fate shall be changed by an unchanging will. This is the boon Ashwapati has received directly from the Divine Mother, and it is in that context Narada is perfectly justified in saying that your least stumblings are forcing about. Everything is already happening here. in that context they had to roll out in that manner in fallibly the curves of life are drawn following the stream of time to the unknown time is unknown for us but not for time time is moving in a given directed manner they are led by a clue the calm immortals keep from immortals immortals here of course stands for gods through the unknown calm immortals you have already seen and moments the gods the calm immortals this moment of the gods and calm immortals they are the same basically you see and then we have a very deep sentence after that this blaze and hieroglyph of prophet moon a meaning most sublime in symbol rise then seal thought wakes to but of this high script how shall my voice convince the mind of Uh, I can't convince the mind of man. It is beyond the rational mind, beyond the capacity of mind. Even the highest mind, even with the greatest intuition, perhaps even with the over mind vision, because this is something which is transcendental. How can I convince that? This is something which happens elsewhere altogether. Now this line is a very packed line. Super surrealistic, if you like to say this line. It is <laughs> surrealism is already there, but I am going to add super. You see, <laughs> to that. this blaze and hieroglyph of prophet moons. What deep occult contents are present here? Diamond-like, packed, intense in this particular phrase. Blazing, bright, shiny, showy, hieroglyph things which cannot be deciphered, script, ancient script, you see. Prophet moons. Now, this prophet moons shows us the encyclopedic knowledge of Sri Aurobindo, the vast background which he has. of world literature world history world development world civilization in one single phase prophet moon prophet moon alone is described in the quran 
prophet moon and in the quran there is a surah which speaks of muhammad having split the moon with his index finger to to so and the moon split that with index finger prophet moon and the symbolism behind it is that it would be the arrival of the day of judgment judgment day of judgment and new things will start happening from that point onward these are the hieroglyphs these are the hieroglyphs things will start happening from that day. when that moon is split like that it means the day of judgment is there and new things will start from that that is according to the purana this is quran in fact the word hieroglyph goes very well with the islamic description hieroglyphs the egyptian hieroglyphs are well known and therefore we could quite logically link up this one with what we have in the muslim tradition in that case hieroglyph of prophet moon prophet the future the bright future so narad is speaking of bright future he is drawing reference allusion making allusion to that event mamat which is index finger hitting the moon into two now there is also the biblical tradition connected with moons not one moon but moon in quran it is single moon split in the biblical tradition genesis particularly they speak of moons and it also pertains to the day of judgment what is going to happen on that day in fact before we go to that let me show you see there is a tradition long tradition perhaps you people know also what is called the tetrad moons tetrad moons four moons no <laughs> okay uh, tetrad moons what it means is that four consecutive eclipses of moon coming one after the other that is called the tetrad moons four four consecutive eclipses full moon coming one after the other that is called the tetrad huh one after the other all the four consecutive all the four consecutive Uh, of course, every yeah, eclipse is always on the full moon. Eclipse is always on the full moon, but for consecutive eclipses of the moon, it may be April, it may be June, whenever it be, but for consecutive eclipses, for consecutive eclipses coming one after the other, that is, that is called the tetrad. And the symbolism of the tetrad is that. it means great events going to take place did we ever have this huh did we ever have this we had uh, about a week ago one of the tetrads on 15th april <laughs> yeah and you did not know no what are the four four one of the four obviously you see it cannot be the same day obviously see one will be in uh, april one will be sometime earlier sometime earlier all the three previous eclipses were full moon eclipses and culminating now with the fourth one that is the tetrad okay. and what is the consequence of the great upheavals great changes <laughs> no that is why well let's say that is why it is a prophet moon that is why it is a prophet moon the phrase prophet means that you see <laughs> great events taking place 
Now it is for us to discern. We will see about that. But basically, the line is this blaze and hieroglyph of Prophet Moses, a meaning more sublime in symbols, which you cannot understand. Arise, then see, thought, etc. You see. Basically, here, Prophet. Now, uh, these are the last lunar eclipse, red moon. Yeah. On 15th April. <laughs> yeah, we had about, about the three, four, three what did it go? Yeah. 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 Yeah, this one. We don't know it as well. Only to be seen in Antarctica and South America and Yeah, but wherever, yeah, wherever. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we didn't see in India. No, no, we didn't see in India. See. No. no. So this is this is the picture now of how the eclipse is developing. He shows the uh, phases of the eclipse, different phases, you see. But this is uh, fantastic. You can make out a string of dots. And in between here, you got red, red. That's the eclipse. Before eclipse, of <laughs> the eclipse. Is it. This is a picture taken by CNN. You see. Before the starting of the eclipse, and then eclipse part here, and then again after the eclipse, you see. Red moon. And this is another one. This is very beautiful. <laughs> Full moon eclipse. You see. Why does it turn red? It is like that. In English. <laughs> yeah, it, it, is, it is red, it's true. <laughs> you can see the changes in color, you see? Yeah. No, it depends upon light and other conditions, you see. You can you can easily make out from here how red it becomes, you see, at a full moon. And the string of moons, time uh, it, it is uh, time marked photograph, you see. Whole set of moons, you see. This is a montage. I'm sure about this. Of course, it's a montage. He put all the, the photo he took about the, the event in one picture. You think so? How you can uh, put the uh, 20 moon together? Yeah, and yeah. after he put the moon. Yeah, of course, after. yeah. You, you must have seen many times no, how the uh, time blooming of a flower is taken. Yeah, yeah, that I mean. Yeah, yeah. So this is the prophet moves, this blazoned hieroglyphic prophet moves. Let me read something. Blood moves, they are called also blood moves, red moves. Decoding the imminent heavenly signs. By this one, you would, that is why you got hieroglyphs, blazoned hieroglyphs, you see. Sign. This is a book by one gentleman, Bills, B I L T Z. And the name of the book is Decoding the Imminent Heavenly Signs by this one. Means what this tetrad of moons means from the civilizational point of view. Clues embedded in biblical text point that something significant will happen. 
because of this one. Things are changing and God is trying to communicate with us in a supernatural way. Hieroglyp of prophet moons, you <laughs> see. She even wrote long before this was there, you see. Does this mean that Jesus is coming? That is what the biblical question we you see. This tetrad. The answer is there is a possibility. One can't say definitely. There is a possibility. Will that be the end of the world? <laughs> no. Huh? End of the world. No. Yeah, that's right. We are living. <laughs> How long no. we have to wait? To we are living. <laughs> no. We yeah. yeah. No, basically, we don't understand the meaning of the end. It means that the old cycle has to vanish, has to disappear, has to go away. That is what the end means, you see. Old cycle has to go away. Now, in the Bible, St. Matthew, he is not directly referring to this event. But before the crucifixion, the scene which he is presenting is something very ominous already. He says, the sun became darkened and the moon shall not give her light, eclipse, and the stars shall fall from heaven. That is the calamitous. Mm. And the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That event. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. That is what basically the biblical connotation means. Basically it means that a new cycle of growth begins with that. End would mean that it is an end. It is a catastrophic end and a new cycle begins. I think we are also experiencing to some extent that kind of a thing in a very subtle manner. <laughs> yeah. And then he says, in the in the in the uh, in the Quranas, the prophet split the moon in two halves with his index finger, pointing out like that. The hour has come near. It means that it is a sign of the arrival of the hour. Our, our, our here of course means the day of judgment. The hour has come near, and the moon be split in. When four consecutive lunar eclipses, total eclipses, then the group is known as a tetrad, as, as, as I just explained to you. It is a cycle of how many? It is a cycle of 18 years, 11 days, 8 hours. <laughs> 18 years, 11 days, 8 hours. Over a period of one tetrad means that long duration. Yeah, I am with you. <laughs> now, he says also, around the crucifixion, Christ's crucifixion, there was no tetrad. No, it was not there. But then he says, the first tetrad was seen in 162 AD. 62 AD, after crucifixion. 162. And I got the dates here. 162 first, next was 795 AD, then was 842, then was 860 AD, then was 1493, in the year 1493, uh, when Columbus had discovered America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all these are symbolic. 1493, then 1949, when? 
1493. Then next is 1949. Long period, that's right. Yeah, long period. And 1949 really saw a great change in things. Let me read uh, 860, then 1493, then 1949. Yeah, when India became independent and all these changes took place and all those big things that happened, you see, 1940, Shavindos withdrawal, all those things were great events, you see. 1949, then next was very swift, 1967. Also, maybe there, perhaps. Is there any the relation? Yeah, they, they, they have calculated. What is it? Exponential. Huh? No, I mean, uh, uh, astronomically, you can calculate. Because it's very, very big. Uh, As, yeah, but. It was very small. For, yeah, that's right. No, but uh, on the basis of the movement of these planets, they can calculate when they, when they can predict when it's going to happen next. Yeah, yeah. Huh. And then yeah. after 1967, we had 2014, yeah. April. Yeah. April, around 15th, you see, it read. So, so, so let us hope that now big changes will take place. <laughs> well, I don't have here, but we can find out. You see, for instance, Columbus was very clear, like that some of them are very significant, immediate also. I can say the 860, 840, 860 or around that time, uh, the, the uh, uh, Arab civilization was at its peak. The Abbasid Empire was a glorious period of history. There is no doubt about that, Abbasid period, you see. Three, three uh, caliphs, you see. So that way, there are there are certain historical relationships also. It's a question of now arguing out. You see. <laughs> so these are the events, and then NASA has calculated that between 1999 and 3000, that is during the current thousand years, current millennium, there will be in all. 12,064 eclipses. <laughs> 12,064. Now, now, out of 12,064, there will be very few tetrads. Obviously, you see. This bless and what a powerful line, you see. And she even wrote that thing in 1946. This line. What is the relation now between all this and this prophet? Do you mean that? Uh, uh, I mean, it's your interpretation that this prophet knows it's about the tetra moons or not? No, it, it means it is going to be a period of great upheavals leading to something new cyclic moment. That is why it is profit also. See, I will say that unless there is some kind of a basis in the, uh, the tradition, whether it is Surah or whether it is Bible or whatever, this is not there in India. Unless there is some truth behind that, Shri Vindu would not make a mention of it here. It means that he is asserting the truth behind the tradition. One line. This blazoned hieroglyph of prophet moon and what a powerful line it is. That is a poetry itself. Solid line, you see. <laughs> this blazoned hieroglyph of prophet moon. A meaning most sublime. Now the rest is simple. The meaning most sublime in symbols writes then seal thought wakes to but of this high script, how shall my voice can be in the mind of earth? This <laughs> See, if Narad can have convinced, you are asking me to convince you. <laughs> that is very unjust. <laughs> and then he says, heavens, wiser love rejects 
the martyr's prayer, unblinded by the breath of his desire, unclouded by the mist of pure and hope, it bends above the strife of love with death. It keeps for her her privilege of pain. It keeps for her her privilege of pain. This is in response to what Ashwapati had asked. I deemed a mighty power had come with her. He is not that power, the high computer of faith. This is what Ashwapati was asking. And Narada is replying, it keeps for her, her privilege of pain. She had to have pain. And he says that heaven is wiser than our considerations, than what we can think of. Heaven rejects the martyr's prayer. Well, we don't understand that thing. Normally, you see, you go to Samadhi and say, I want this, I want that, is it, is it. <laughs> And Samadhi, in her wisdom, says, sorry, you are not going to get that. <laughs> because perhaps it might prove a kind of a block for your progress, you see. So you have to work out yourself, you see. <laughs> Heaven's wiser love rejects the mortal's prayer. Unblinded, it is not blinded by our ideas and thoughts and our thinking and our arguments, you see. It does not get blinded by that. A great nation, thy daughter's soul decides that can transform herself and all around. This is the assurance Narada is giving to Ashwapati, the yogi, who already knows it. Great nation, thy daughter's soul decides. Now, there is something very important that can transform herself. He doesn't say it will transform. He doesn't know that. Not only he doesn't know that, maybe he knows also, but he is not going to say it will. No, because there is a condition after. Pardon me? Because there is a condition. It means she can, but she transform herself. No, no, that she is going to. That is uh, inevitable. That would uh, grant it. Let her suffer. Doesn't matter. But will she transform after suffering? Maybe. So that's why she, she can. can. <laughs> that is why. <laughs> that is why I can. Yeah. That is why I can. Basically, Narad is perfectly justified in saying can. Not that he does not know. Whereas he knows it also. He is perfectly justified in saying, can transform. Because it will depend how successfully Savitri is going to do her yoga. Savitri has yet to do yoga. She has not started her yoga yet. How can he say, yes, she will? Before doing the yoga, how can Narada say she will? No. <laughs> no. Yeah, no. She has to do some yoga. She, she has to put in her work, you see. Then it can happen. If she does her yoga, if she does not succumb, she does not get astray in the yoga and all that kind of a thing, which are all possibilities. You see. All those things are present there. If that does not happen, yes, she will transform. But you cannot rule out in the cosmic working, all those possibilities. So he is very cautious. See, the language is extremely precise. It is more mathematical. It is more French than French can be. <laughs> you see? Yeah. Yeah. But must cross on the stone. It's all right. That I accept. You see, it's okay. Although designed like a nectar cup of heaven, of heavenly ether made she sought this air. She too must share the human need of grief and all her cause of joy transmute 
to pain. She must accept the pain of her work. She has to bear the suffering of this work. She has taken the mortal birth. She must go to the entire ordeal of the mortal birth, of the human birth. Without experiencing that thing, how she can change things here? She must suffer for that. She too must share the human need of grief. Now, again, he says human need, need of grief. See, you cannot make progress without grief. It is necessary to have grief. Need of grief. Savitri herself in a divine self. There is no grief at all. And unless she experiences that grief, unless she needs that grief some way, how can she meet it? She too must share the human need. Human need is very crucial. Psychologically, it is packed. In fact, we do not progress without that grief. Without death, we do not live life. And then, the mind of mortal man is led by words. His sight retires behind the walls of thought and looks out only through half-opened doors. Well, that, that is what we are. But that also happens very rarely. Not that for every mortal it happens. But those who are ready, who have made progress, for them, the mind of mortal man is led by words. His sight retires behind the walls of thought. It cannot penetrate the screen which our mind puts to our sight. That drishti, that vision is not there which can go beyond the veil of thought in our case. And looks out only through half-open doors. Half-open, obviously, ours is a consciousness which is half ignorance of knowledge. And therefore, it is like that. He cuts the boundless truth into sky steps. Now, this is the character of mind. This is the character of mind. The whole approach of mind of the mental being is to understand truth by taking the bits of truth, small, small, small pieces. I mean, ours is an analytical approach. Cut, 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 and try to understand it. Not synthetic, not holistic, at all, you see. So, the whole sky is there, we can't see the whole sky at once. So, you see north, you see this part, you see this part, you see this part, and then try to join and try to understand, you see. He cuts the boundless truth into sky strips. Truth of communalism, truth of capitalism, truth of education, <laughs> truth of mankind, whatever. You see, oh, this is what we see. Everything is a truth. These are the sky strips, you see. And every strip he takes for all the heavens. That is our limitation. We get stuck with one particular idea truth. We don't have the vision of the totality. And then he stares at infinite possibility. Now here, it is not possibilities, it is possibility with the capital. In other words, in this creation, there is the possibility of expression of the spirit in every respect, every aspect of the spirit can express itself in this creation. That possibility is there present. But man's mind, man's vision cannot look into it at all. It's so blinding, so dazzling, that possibility. So he simply looks at it, stares at it, and give the plastic mask the name of chance. So that is what we then see. He sees 
the long results of an all wise force planning a sequence of steps in endless time but in its links imagines a senseless chain or the dead hand of cold necessity he answers not to the mystic mother's heart misses the ardent heavings of her breast and feels cold dead limbs of lifeless love now this is a heavy metaphysical sentence <laughs> all connotations are there endless time obviously the time is unbroken but we cut into parts past present future we look into that kind of a thing you see imagine a senseless chain we cannot link up the sequences the operations here hand of cold necessity he answers not to the mystic mother's heart now necessity well basically here you have essentially the heaviness of greek philosophy in this particular passage greek philosophy necessity law chance he has already talked of chance see see all these are connected possibility then chance then chain cause and effect causality necessity law they are all interrelated words they are all interrelated words necessity i have told you many times i mean the name for necessity the greek goddess is ananke and even the gods are ruled by the law of ananke by the will of ananke even the gods are ruled they cannot refuse and therefore what she says is called must happen such a one must die it is a necessity such a one must die is a necessity that is what it means basically now necessity should also goes should also go along with sufficiency something may be necessary but is that sufficient something must be food is necessary for life but is food sufficient for life it is not there are many other demands in life apart from food and we ask them we wait for them we work for them so necessity and sufficiency have to be also linked up you see and it is there in fact that is a good, good example food is necessary for life but not sufficient in the lower creation of animals it is necessary and it lives they don't bother about sufficiency they don't have any other aspects at all in their dealings with life here live eat die so all right process goes on like that but in this link imagine a senseless chain now senseless chain this is the cause and effect philosophy something cannot happen unless there was a cause behind it and that what has happened itself becomes a cause for the next sequence of events that chain goes on you see and feel the cold rigid limbs of lifeless law now as i said just now the death of satyavan is a necessity but that is not sufficient <laughs> it's not sufficient you see he must die is a necessity then things will happen but things will happen when the sufficiency will come when savitri takes this obligation to take things forward 
it is that fulfillment which will come what we have in the 11th book of Savitri. She goes to divine supreme himself and then gets boons from him. That is the sufficiency. In the beginning, prior to that, is a necessity. The will of the timeless working out in time. Yes, that is the whole cosmic process. Who is about time? He is working through time. Kala. In the three absolute steps of cosmic truth appears a hard machine or meaningless fate. So, here again is the operative definition of fate. What is fate here? In the three absolute steps of cosmic truth, a hard working is fate. In the cosmic working, you see. A magician's formulas have made matters laws. Again, he is saying that there is a scheme behind all these things, matters law. And while they last, they miss the laws. While they last, all things by them are bound. Yes, we are bound by law. We are bound by ignorance, we are bound by sorrow, we are bound by suffering. They are the laws, cosmic laws, matters laws. Yes. Now, of course, to die is our habit. We die out of habit. <laughs> is it not so? Yes, we really die out of habit. But Shivendu asserts that habits can be changed. Habits can be changed. To die is a habit, but habit can be changed. You need not be subject always to that habit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And freedom walks in the same pace with law. All here can change if the magician choose. So that is the epigrammatic statement now. The magician, the supreme, if he desires to change, he will change. And then he says, if how? He loves that thing. If human will could be made one with God's will. That is the first condition. Human will has to be one with the will of God. If human thought could echo the thoughts of God, man might be all-knowing and even omnipotent. What a great compliment he is giving you. But now he walks in nature's doubtful way. He is subject to nature at the moment. He will be helpless. He has to get out of this law of nature. First, if human will could be made one with God's, this is the most operative statement. The, when does your free will really come into play? When do I have real free will? In fact, right now I don't have a free will at all. I like this sweet, I like that mango, I like that fruit, I like... This is not really my free will, it's not my choice. My nature compels me to like it. My body is built up in such a way that I must eat that and nothing else, I must reject. So I am compelled to choose this fruit or that fruit. Until then, I have no choice at all. There is no free will at all. The free will comes when you are above nature, when you really live in your soul. Then the free will comes, not until then. So, if human will could be made one with God's, does it mean that the human will will not be any different than God's will, then where are you? <laughs> what have you gained? Then what have you gained? You see. Then let God himself do. How does it matter then for me? It does not mean that. It means 
when you are in the truth consciousness, when you are in that state constantly, when you are that, then you can exercise your own true will. And we had two beautiful examples of how each one can have his own free will in Savitri. The first example is, of course, Ashwapati himself. Ashwapati approaches the Divine Mother with the plea that things in this world should change. This mortal law should go away. That is desire. And the Divine Mother tells him, Look, Ashwapati, you are in a great hurry. Don't be in a hurry. It may prove disastrous. If I come too soon, things may collapse. Don't be in a hurry. Now, this man, this yogi or whatever to call him, has the courage to say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to accept your advice. This will not do for me. I want this must happen. You must come down here and take mortal birth. Send a power of yours here on earth. He is exercising his free will there. She is advising something, the divine, he has the courage to oppose her and say, sorry, this is not too for me. And say that, yes, you must take the mortal birth and change things here. You must come here as Savitri and do the work here in the mortal creation. So his will, human will, is no more human will now. He has identified himself so much with the divine truth that he can exercise his true free will and demand what he wants. Demand what he wants. You see. That is the real free will. You see. That happens only in exceptional cases like that. Same thing happened in the case of Savitri also. Savitri has conquered death, vanquished death, she is no more there, and she is in the transcendent, and she is face to face with the Supreme, and Savitri is well received there. Ah, Savitri, you have done a wonderful thing. Great conquest. Come here and stay in this heaven. You stay here with your husband. Be happy. Everything is here, whatever you want here. Everything is here. She was told to do that. Savitri says, I am sorry, I am not going to accept that. I don't need heaven. Keep the heavens for yourself. <laughs> I don't need heaven. Whatever I want, I want for the sake of the earth. Not heaven. I want for the soul of the earth. So please give me what I want. Don't advise me to go and stay in heaven. She is exercising again there her free will. That is the truth will. Human will could be made one with God's. That is what it means. Frankly, how in this condition you can call it free? Yeah. He can be fulfilled only if he is equal with the will of God. So it's not really free. Yeah. So unless you are really identified with him fully, so it's not you free. are in a truth consciousness all the while. He can be omnipotent only if he is all knowing and omnipotent. To the God's yeah. will. Just so right. it's not really. We are not really free. Huh? No, but <laughs> that omnipotence. He might be all knowing and omnipotent. You are not omnipotent and you are not, uh, if you don't have the same will that God, you cannot do anything. The condition is not fulfilled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but at the moment he says, no, but now, but now he walks in nature's doubtful ray. That is what we are at the moment. So, yeah. you can yet can him. So in spite of that, he is giving a little hope also to us, to poor, so, to poor souls, <laughs> to little souls. Yet, can the mind of man receive God's light? The force of man can be driven by God's force. Then is he a miracle doing miracles. <laughs> that is when you really open yourself out fully to God's light and God's force. God's light and God's force, when you really open out. In other words, you really become the instrument of God. You become vibhuti to do God's work. You become vibhuti to do God's work. Yet can the mind of man receive God's light? 
the force of man can be driven by God's force, then is a miracle doing miracles. In fact, there is no miracle there. Whatever happens kind of happens naturally in that consciousness. For only so can he be nature's king. And then he hammers out again, or it is decreed, and such a man must die. It is necessity, <laughs> as I said. <laughs> it is decreed. Nobody can say that decree. This is the Ananki. She is deciding, she has decided he must die. <coughs> it is the decree. And such a man must die. The hour is fixed, chosen the fatal stroke. So all these are now cosmic operations which will go through. How he will die, etc., etc., well, that is the cosmic part. That is the part of the fate. In other words, this is an aspect of fate's working in the cosmic operations. This is an aspect of necessity or the ananki working in the transcendent. She has decided something, it must happen. How it is going to happen here, that will be decided by fate. That will be decided by fate. Actually, if we call this thing as necessity, then necessity is a mother of fate. It is decided how it is going to happen. Fate. She is the one who is giving rise to all these things has to happen. Nobody can change this one. It is decreed. How it is going to be worked out is a question of details of cosmic working. And that is what we would call fate. So fate is subject to necessity. What else shall be is written in her soul. It has to happen, that's all right. What else shall be is written in her soul. Obviously, Narada also will not be able to know what else is written. He himself doesn't know that knowledge. He cannot read the soul of Savitri. He has no access to read what is written in her soul. And therefore he is safe. I don't know, I'm sorry, I can't tell you what is going to happen, this way or that way, etc. But this much is certain that Satyavan has to die. And this much I can tell you, you see. How is it going to happen? What are the possibilities will open out? That I can't tell you. In other words, as far as Naru is concerned, he is definite up to 10th book. He cannot say anything about the 11th book. What else is going to happen in the book of everlasting day? He says, I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. That is between Savitri's soul and the Supreme. 11th book is for that, her soul. But still the hour, but till the hour reveals the fateful script, the writing ways illegible and mute. It is decreed that this shall happen. And the writing remains illegible and mute, obviously. Now, he says, Till the hour reveal the fateful script, the writing ways illegible. Is the writing illegible to Narad? <laughs> Certainly not. He has seen it. He has known it. It is illegible to the human soul, to we people. Savitri herself would not know at this point. And then, this is one of the most beautiful definitions of fate given by Narada. Fate is truth working out in ignorance. That is the definition of fate according to Narada. 
Fate is truth working out in ignorance. In the cosmic play, cosmic play is the play of ignorance. You are living in the overmind creation and lower, in the world of ignorance. And the operations which go on in the cosmos, they are the working out in ignorance. And the agency who does it, it is sweet as truth, truth as sweet rather. So, if you extend the definition, fate is the truth working out in ignorance, then we can also say that necessity is truth working out in knowledge. We can extend the definition, what is necessity? Fate is the daughter of necessity. If she is working out in ignorance, then how is the mother working out? She is working out in knowledge. So necessity is truth working out in knowledge. We can put that definition for as an extension of this definition. Fate is truth working out in ignorance, in the cosmic process. In other words, in the transcendent, the truth dynamism which operates, which operates in full knowledge of things, in full knowledge of things. The other word for the dynamism in the transcendent is the Vedic word rhythm, rhythm. So necessity we can link up with rhythm as a dynamic aspect of truth working out things in knowledge. That is rhythm. And as a result of that rhythm, we have fate. Fate, here we call it in Sanskrit, niyati, the working of cosmic forces, niyati. O oh, king, thy fate is a transaction done. It is done, finished. At every hour between nature and thy soul with God or its forcing arbiter. Now, of course, this applies to highly evolved individuals like Ashwapati. Thy fate is a transaction done at every hour between nature and thy soul because his soul is alert and he has taken the mortal birth, he has taken the human birth. Therefore, it is a transaction between nature and soul the dealing relation with God for its the balance, if it all to be tilted between soul and nature, will be decided by God. Fate is a balance drawn in destiny's book. Man can accept his fate, he can refuse. That is choice given to us, but that is choice given to whom? To somebody like this. To somebody like this. Whose soul is alert, who knows the working of nature. It is for him. See, we are walking and we have stepped on an ant. <laughs> Now poor fellow, poor ant has no, no uh, will at all, cannot exercise anything at all. Well, it accepts whatever happens. It's a law of nature, not fate. There's no fate involved there. There's no fate involved there, you see. Oh. Only when the soul is alert, then the fate comes to the picture. All these things which happen on the roads, accidents take place, this happens, that happens, this happens. It keeps on happening. It's a part of nature, you see. It's not part of fate. Fate happens when your soul has come out fully, is conscious of things. Then fate comes. Then it becomes the law, arbiter, you see. Not until then. You can't say that the fruit has ripened and therefore it has fallen. You can't say that it is the fate of the fruit <laughs> to have fallen. It's a law, you see. 
fate is a balance drawn in destiny is good. Man can accept his fate. Now this man of course means a highly evolved man, obviously. In other words, here, Savitri has a choice. She can accept what is fitted. Satyavan has to die. She can accept, she can reject it also. She can reject it also, you see. What will happen, that's a different matter. But she has a choice here. And then, even if one maintains the unseen decree, he writes thy refusal in the credit page. So, if Savitri says no, well, even that will be written down in her credit page. For doom is not a close, a mystic seal. Arisen from the tragic crash of life, arisen from the body's torture on death, arisen from the tragic crash of life, arisen from the body's torture and death, the spirit rises mightier by defeat. Its godlike wings grow wider with each fall. It's a poetic way of saying how you progress in spite of difficulties. It's splendid failures, some to victory. Of course, as I said earlier, all these things applicable. Man can accept his fate, can refuse for a fairly well developed human soul. For human souls not for ordinary man. O oh man, the events that meet thee on thy road, though they smite thy body and soul with joy and grief, are not thy fate. Again, this man, as I said, is a different kind of man, not ordinary man, you see. Are not thy fate. They touch thee a while and pass. Grief and joy, trusty and power. Even death can cut not short the spirit's walk. Now, this is a mighty line. This is a mighty line, you see. Even death can cut not short the spirit's walk. Thy goal, the road thou choosest, are thy fate. In other words, he is indirectly telling Savitri, Savitri, you better do your work. You have a task to do, you attend to it. This has to happen, it cannot be avoided. Savitri is a human person now at the moment. She has still to do her yoga. She has to undertake the entire arduous process of yogic growth. Unless that is done, she cannot really do that thing, you see. Or die of it. You better choose that fight and do that thing. On the altar, throwing thy thoughts, thy heart, thy works, thy fate is a long sacrifice to the gods till they have opened to thee thy secret self and made thee one with indwelling God. That is what Savitri has to do basically. Of course, he is addressing here to man, but the context is, of course, Savitri. Now, here, on the art of throwing thy thoughts, thy heart, thy works. It is a sacrifice, it is yajna. It is a Vedic yajna which Narada is describing. Vedic yajna. And what are you putting in the yajna fire? your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, your actions, your activities, everything you are putting in. In other words, jnana, bhakti, karma, thoughts, jnana, heart, bhakti, 
वर्ष कर्मा ऑल दीज थिंग्स ऑफ योगिक काइंड वेच आर डिस्क्राइब इन द गीता द गीता योगा कंसिस्ट ऑफ दीज थ्री पार्ट्स नॉलेज एक्शन डिवोशन all these things now had to be put in the altar fire of god everything had to be put in the altar of god on the altar throwing the thought the heart the world the entire gita's yoga is to put in the yajna fire and then thy fate is a long sacrifice to god then the god will arise from till they have opened to thee thy secret self and made thee one with the indwelling god this is what happened in the case of shrivanu when he was in alipur jail he says the geeta was put in my hand the gita was put in my hand what he practiced there was the yoga of the gita at the time in 1908 about that time and as a result of that then what happened till they have opened to the thy secret self then his self really opened out the hand of the gita was there he had put the gita in his hand and then the secret self opened out till they have opened to the thy secret self and made the one with the indwelling god that is the realization which he had that is the realization which he had so you can see certain kind of autobiography glimpses also in the description you see of course this is universal but we can read a part of his life in that way the gita was put in his hand and he had that experience that secret self that secret self that is what he had realized there see and everything became to him vasudeva 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 see god 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 you will fear and made the and that is the fit so once that is there then he goes away from Kolkata to Chandigarh, from Chandigarh to Pondicherry, all that the fate gets arranged. By fate, it gets arranged everything. Not only that, in the course of time, then the 29th March 1914 also comes as a part of that fate's working. Everything happens then automatically. See, O soul, intruder in nature's ignorance. Arm traveler to the unseen supernal heights, thy spirit's fate is a battle and ceaseless march against invisible apparent power, a passage from matter into timeless self. Now he is addressing. First he was addressing to Ashwapati, to the king, to man, basically indirectly. he is now generalizing basic soul essentially it is to the aspiring soul of man to whom he is addressing these things the ready soul of man ripened soul of man whole soul intruder in nature's ignorance now this is a wonderful phrase he says after all what is soul he is an intruder in nature's ignorance <laughs> now okay we'll see that thing then i am traveler to the unseen supernal height the soul has come down here into ignorance and now he has become a traveler to supernal heights i am because he has to meet the opposition the battle that spirit and therefore because he is armed he is the traveler he is meeting 
His fate is a battle and ceaseless march against invisible opponent powers. A passage from matter into timeless self. Because the soul has entered into ignorance, it has become a battle in all that thing. Now this line, intruder, would mean unwelcome guest. <laughs> Basically. You are talking, somebody just comes and uh, enters into a room or whatever it is. He is an intruder. He is not a welcome guest at all. He was not invited for this question. <laughs> now, is really the soul an intruder in ignorance? Ignorance didn't bother. Ignorance was busy with her own work and all that thing. This man, somebody comes and enters into it and uh, disturbs it, you see, intruders. It's not that, basically. In other words, as we have seen earlier, our soul had made a deliberate choice to enter into ignorance. So there is no, he doesn't wait now for an invitation. He doesn't wait for an invitation. He has made a deliberate choice. Soul was up there. We have already seen earlier. He was up there. It was there. Very happy, etc., etc. All those things were there. But he saw the shadow of truth below and became curious of it. Now, out of that curiosity, he has come here. He is not introducing. Shadow is not going to invite him. Shadow will not invite him. He is trusting himself upon it. The shadow is trusting, sorry, the soul is trusting itself upon the shadow. Upon. So you call it it, I don't care about that. It's trusting itself. For a purpose. Because that is the only way by which this can happen. Why? Then he becomes a traveler and he moves his feet and his march becomes from matter to Timeless self, out of ignorance. So, shadow, the, 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 the truth, sorry, the soul is not going to wait for an invitation from the shadow. It has become curious of it and it has thrust itself into ignorance to work out something of that ignorance. And that is what is going to happen here. A passage from matter, it is for that purpose, the soul has entered it. For that purpose, the soul has included. And therefore, naturally, adventurer to blind, unforcing time, a forced advance through a long line of lives, it pushes his spirit through the centuries because it has entered into that thing as an intruder. He has become an adventurer now, he has entered into ignorance as an intruder, because it became curious. He didn't wait for an invitation from ignorance to enter into it. He saw the shadow of the truth there, got attracted by the shadow and plunged into it. He, in other words, the soul has really thrust itself into ignorance. <laughs> 